So welcome everybody to our course, Federated Learning, which will be offered now in uh, period four and five. Uh, yeah, this course is offered hybrid, as you see now. So some of you are here now in the lecture hall. Uh, some of you are in uh, Zoom, joining us via Zoom. Just to <clears throat> highlight, there is no mandatory presence in this course. So you can complete this course fully re remote and online. However, uh, I recommend if, you, uh, if it's easily possible for you to attend the live lectures, it's more fun for me. And uh, it's also easier for you to ask questions. However, I will try also to uh, regularly check uh, questions posted on Slack. So we also have our Slack channel that you might want to join. You find the, the link to the Slack channel on the My Courses page. Does anyone have problems to uh, access My Courses, the My Courses site for this course? Any problems? If you have troubles getting access to My Courses, please send me an email. Okay, so let me start with the, the basic uh, characteristics or parameters of the course. The course is offered in its basic variant as a, a five credit course, uh, but can be extended to, to a 10 credit course using a, a student project. I will talk more about the student uh, project later on, but let's first focus on, on the basic variant so the basic course variant is worth five credits, which is roughly hundred. Yes. 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 So now you also see the, the my courses page on Zoom. So any questions regarding the, the two variants? So we have a five credits basic variant course uh, and the extended 10 credit course. The student project, this will be mostly happening in, uh, in later parts of the course. So towards April, May, the basic variant uh, consists mainly of, of lectures. So this will be the, the main content, the meat of the course, so to say, good old, good old fashioned lecture-based course, we will have some uh, 12 lectures and each lecture or no, not all, 10 of those 10 uh, lectures contain quizzes or quiz questions. So for example, the, uh, the lecture on, on Wednesday on the machine learning design principle has a quiz which will open. So the quiz will always open on the day of the lecture of the corresponding lecture and you have seven days to complete the quiz. For each quiz, you have two attempts. And when you start one attempt, you must complete the attempt within two hours. So uh, it should be not too stressful for you. It's always important that the activities are not too stressful, but still challenge you a bit to, to uh, facilitate the learning. If you are unhappy with your results to the quiz questions, so it's, let's say you, you decide to do a quiz while hiking on Kilimanjaro and all of a sudden you don't have a Wi-Fi connection, although it seems on Kilimanjaro you also have good connection and you cannot complete the second attempt, then you still have the opportunity towards the end of the course to uh, make up in, a, uh, in an oral meeting, like a, a Zoom meeting where we talk about the subject of the quiz. Or are you unhappy with with the results of your quiz, you will have a, uh, an opportunity to review your any of your quiz uh, answers in the end of the course. So don't worry, don't stress too much. If some attempt for some reason fails or you're unhappy, you will have the chance then to, uh, to explain and to review the attempts with me in the end of the course. Yes. So after submitting the quiz once, we want to submit the second time. Uh, do we get a grading of the first submission? Yeah, so uh, when you submit one attempt, this counts. Uh, and in general, the, the better attempt counts. So you can only improve with the second attempt. Okay, but do we get a grading for the first submission before submitting the second submission? Like how you, much? You, how you will know, uh, yeah, how, how much, 
I will check. Yeah, we should. I'm, I'm not sure if, if we will, how much details we will release. Yeah, not much details, but if you know if it's correct. A, a correct or, or, or not correct, yes. This, this should be released after the first, first attempt. Yeah, I will check this. Make sure that you, that you see how well you did, yeah. Okay, any other questions regarding the quizzes? Yeah, a small question. You have put one attempt here on my courses, actually, are you gonna change it later? Uh, yeah, I need to correct this. There should be two attempts. Okay, thank you. I hope I thought I corrected it already. Ah, uh, yeah, attempts allowed to just say uh, shows to do make it and so it's kind of confusing. Two attempts, yeah, yeah. So you you have two attempts in total. Okay. Any other questions regarding quizzes? Yes. Yes, the best counts. You cannot, you cannot uh, decrease your uh, points by the second attempt. Yeah, so uh, in general, I like to, to use grading as a, a, a way to motivate you and not to, to, to stress you, but still it needs to be fair. So we have to do something to determine your grade. Uh, but uh, if you work uh, seriously on the course, I guess you will have a hard time not to get a good grade. Okay. Yeah, uh, formal, formally the grading will be uh, pretty straightforward. So you can collect points via different activities. One type of activity are the quizzes that I just explained. And uh, in total, so the, the, we then collect all the points you, you, collect, uh, you obtained and uh, then the grade will be determined according to the rule 50 to 59 points will be grade uh, one then from 60 to 69, grade two, and so on and so forth. And if you uh, achieved or if you earned 90 or more points, you will get the top grade five. Okay. Yes, uh, other activities beside the, beside the quizzes will be uh, hands-on labs. So for example, we have a first lab already starting next week. You can register yourself. Uh, by uh, putting a name or some identifier into this uh, spreadsheet prepared by one of the TAs. We will also inform you about the precise location still. Yes, it's missing. So you don't need to put your name. You just put uh, some identifier that you remember yourself, that you put the identifier, of course. Uh, and uh, so we have these different time slots between 12 and 12.30, and you can form uh, form groups here. So I leave it up to you to form groups. But then you need to answer questions regarding to the, the content of the lab to get the, the points. So we are still negotiating or deciding how many points we offer. I think for the first lab, I didn't write it down yet. You can earn maximum five points. And we will currently we plan to have uh, three such labs. And in this lab, what you will do is hands-on implementation of federated learning algorithms. So in this first lab, you will get you will get familiar with the hardware. So in lab one, the hardware are Raspberry Pis. You can run federated learning algorithms on on the small computers uh, using Raspberry Pis. Uh, yeah, so this gives you an opportunity. These labs give you an opportunity to do hands-on implementation of the federated learning algorithms I explain in the lectures. Okay, any questions regarding the labs? Yes. So these are like in-person activities in this particular lab. So the Raspberry Pi will be provided. Will be provided, yes. And we can explain it. Yes. Cool. Yes. So this, of course, uh, if somebody insists he wants a fair treatment and it was advertised as online, then we will think about ways to also offer this online. But the preferred option is that you come here into one of the uh, lab rooms, which we will rent and you really use a, a Raspberry Pi hardware. But maybe we find also a simulator where you can do also this online. Okay. Yeah, the, the second lab uh, is also uh, ready-made. In this second la lab, you will implement, uh, uh, oh, so you will get access to a real web server. So we have 
uh, have been provided from our IT department uh, a web server. So you can really program a web server that responds to requests from federated learning algorithms and implement federated averaging. You will hear about federated averaging in one of the later lectures. Okay. So beside quizzes, you have labs where you can <clears throat> earn points. <clears throat> then I also offer points for solutions to the exercises in the lecture notes. So how, how many of you have uh, looked into the lecture notes already? Yes, so towards the end of each section, you find uh, exercises. And if you're interested in one of these exercises, a lot of symbols in the beginning. <laughs> yes, so here we have an exercise. Uh, each exercise also indicates the number of points you can earn. So uh, work out uh, one of these exercises, send us your, your solution by email. And uh, we will then grade, or some of the TAs will grade your submissions. So this is also a way to collect points. Yeah, there are, of course, different levels of exercises. There are some very hard where you can earn up to 50 points, but this might take a bit more work to solve. Yeah, uh, then I also offer you the option for an oral exam about the entire course. So if you say you are now stressed uh, with all these activities, Although I highly recommend to collect now points with, by these quizzes, because this also gives you a rhythm. So I learned that it's very important to have also the right study rhythm. And I would like you to act, uh, actively follow the course now. But if for some reason or the other, you, you don't have time now, uh, I, I must admit when I was a student, my approach was to uh, ignore all the lectures and then go to final exam. But I would not recommend you this. But if some of you like to do this, you can do an oral exam at the end and still earn up to 100 points in this oral exam. But this will be about the entire course then. Okay, and then some of you have already used this opportunity to earn bonus points for pointing out typos or improving, uh, suggesting imp uh, improvements uh, for the clarity of presentation in the lecture notes. Okay. Any questions regarding the grading? So there are different types of activities. You are free to collect points by whatever activity you prefer. There is no minimum requirement for any activity. Yes. No, we add, we add together. I yes. have a similar question. Right? You can get way more than 100 points. If you yes. Want. Yes. And but still, like, it's uh, still what the quantitative uh, measure, right? So as soon as you're above 90, you're good. Yes. Yes. If you, if you collect 90 points by quizzes, you're still welcome to do an oral exam with me, but you don't have to. Yes. Yeah, you can ask questions. Uh, uh, I, I now actually found one question on Zoom. So Zoom seems to be uh, better reaching my attention than, than Slack. So, but I will also try to read to, or maybe maybe you, could you help me um, monitoring questions on Slack? Yeah, thank you. So either on Slack or via the Zoom chat, please also ask your questions. Any other what, questions? What what happens if you have more than 100 points? Do you have, do you get more credits? Uh, like, uh, let's say you no. get 150 Good points. Question. Okay. Good question. Excellent question. That brings me to the, to the 10 credit variant. So uh, even if you have for the basic variant that I just explained, you collect more than 100 points, you will not get more credits and you will not get a higher grade than five. I, I can try to write a higher grade than five, but I guess the bureaucracy at Alto will not allow it. <laughs> and, uh, but you, if you are so motivated, uh, or man, if you collect many points, this might be an indicator that you could be interested in the 10 credit variant. And in the 10 credit variant, 
uh, you have to do a student project. And this uh, student project amounts to taking one application that you're interested in. This can be anything. So it's completely free. Could be the weather, could be uh, the analyzing pedestrian or analyzing the passengers of the metro line. A metro consists of stations which are connected, which are connected by a, a network structure. So this gives rise to a federated learning setting. Uh, so you can pick whatever application you want, but you, uh, then you need to formulate it as a federated learning problem. You will learn how to formulate a federated learning problem in this course. So you need to define what the data points are, what the, the network structure of the data is. Then you have to try out at least two different methods, explain how you applied them, explain the results. You will hear about methods in this course. So you will use the methods that you have heard in this course. Then you do, conduct some numerical experiments. You discuss the numerical, the results of the numerical experiments and uh, kind of uh, compile a, a report about it. And the whole format is geared towards uh, uh, such that you or geared towards a conference submission in the end. So the student projects might also be used if you have a, a research application and you think federated learning methods could be useful. In the student project, you can try out. And I'm not sure yet, so I'm still thinking about also then uh, using peer grading, peer grading for the student project. So you will also get peer feedback on your on your uh, report. Yes. I suppose not. That it's impossible to do the project after the period of forty five, like in the summers. Yes, so this depends if we if we organize peer grading, then we need to be some uh, a bit more strict with, with the timing. But currently, uh, I actually, I, I'm, I'm not so much in favor of peer grading and then you are free to send whenever you want. So then there will be at least time till end of the summer. Yeah, to submit the student project. But if we do peer grading, then we, of course, need to synchronize so somehow. Yes. So is the project the class? Slash fail. So if you get a credit from the basic version, then the then credit grade will be if this passes, then fail. Or is there a separate grade for this? Uh, I didn't fix the grading yet, but uh, the, the grading for the student project will also be based on the review. So either via peer review, you will get a, a, a grade for the for the project. So you will definitely also be be uh, get the number of points for the student project. But how then to combine is, is still to be determined. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. We have some questions. Do we get assistance for exercises at the end of the lectures? Uh, Assistance for well, the exercises they are they are voluntary, so you can pick uh, exercises from the lecture notes and, and work on them. This is independent, but of course you might reach out to to the course staff with specific questions. But currently we do not plan uh, de dedicated uh, exercise sessions. Then there's another question. Let's say I want to do a project and use it for my machine learning research project course. Who will be my supervisor? Uh, yes. Yeah, so if you if you want to use it for a, a, a research project course, then you must have a, a supervisor for this course. So I can I can of course uh, I could serve as the supervisor. But typically these courses also have teachers in charge, so maybe they will be supervisor. But I would be I would be interested or willing to then also serve as supervisor. It would make sense. Of course, uh, I just need to highlight you cannot use the same the same output, the same report to get two two course grades. So this, of course, is not possible. This is a double team effort. Uh, then another question: uh, Would it be okay to do labs at home if I happen to own an old Raspberry Pi? I'm working full time, so coming to campus is challenging. Yes, that will be possible. We will make this possible. Uh, but on an individual basis, so we will arrange this with the with the TAs. Please uh, reach out to us by email in such special circumstances. Okay, then another question: Do you get more points 
on Fitech badge by making a student project if you don't need ECTS? Um, this, I don't know. I'm not sure if we have much influence on this. I, I need to ask our Fitech coordinators. So Fitech, yeah, by the way, this course is also offered for adult learners via Fitech. Uh, so if you, if you are taking this course via Fitech, you get, as I understood, you get this electronic certificate or badge. But I'm not sure. I will ask if we can, if we have influence on the number of points there. Okay, uh, next question. Is there a deadline for the exercises on the notes? No, you can send me the solutions or send the solutions whenever you, you have them. Okay. Uh, yeah, just uh, now this reminds me, the solutions please send to the email address CS. Uh, let's see if I can zoom in. Yeah, our course email address is C uh, line E4740 at alto.fi. Please use this email address regarding uh, solutions to the uh, exercises in the lecture notes or special arrangements for the labs or anything. Please use this course email address. Uh, then I also uh, encourage you to make use of our Slack channel. So uh, does any one of you have problems to, to join the Slack channel? No. If you have problems, please send me an email. I guess the Slack is the most convenient way to get quickly information or help on specific questions, either from, from your fellow students or from the course staff. Okay. That's about the practicalities, I would say. Then, yes. Labs. We will offer maximum three labs. Three, yeah. Okay, so let me now give you an overview or let me walk through the lectures. So today we, we are in the course logistics lecture, uh, which also will touch a bit of the topics that are uh, discussed in section one of the lecture notes. Then next Wednesday, we will do the one hour review of machine learning. I assume many, many of you have already taken machine learning courses, maybe even from me. So we will give a quick review. Yeah, by the way, what are the three main components of machine learning? Sorry, graduate student. Optimization. Optimization. Yeah, that's already. Good. Okay, so there's still something I can tell you then on, on Wednesday. Sounds good. Then after uh, this basic machine learning design principle, we talk about regularization. So regularization is maybe the most important topic when it comes to applying machine learning. Uh, this uh, machine learning design principle is, is very <clears throat> conceptually simple and straightforward but when it comes to applying machine learning methods the tricks to make a machine learning method work is often one way or another way to do regularization and it's often not clear or not obvious that you do regularization but for example early stopping in deep learning is a form of regularization okay then i will I have one lecture on gradient methods. How many of you have heard about gradient descent? Very good. So this will be maybe for many of you a, a, a review, but also maybe you will hear something that you didn't know. And this is how, how basic gradient descent is optimal uh, already. So in, in which setting you cannot do better than uh, basic gradient descent by any other method. Then we will slowly work towards federated learning. So we will talk about network models. What sets federated learning apart from machine learning is a specific, des uh, specific design choices for data and models and loss functions. So if we have here machine learning, then federated learning is a, a subset, special case of machine learning. And the difference is that we use network models. We use network 
models for data, for data, and for machine learning models. So instead of having one data set, the data set being a bunch of data points, in federated learning, we have a collection of local data sets. So this collection of local data sets could be generated by uh, smartphones, for example. So each local data set is generated by smartphones who record cuffs during a pandemic. Or my prime, my prime example for network data is weather data, because you have a weather station in Turku, you have a weather station in Helsinki, but you have a weather station in Kuopio. So instead of one data set, single data set, you have a whole collection of, of data sets. So where does the network come into play? These, net, uh, these data sets are typically related by similarity relations. So you say the weather in Turku might be similar to the weather in Helsinki because they are both on the coastline. So we have an intrinsic network structure that we can represent by, by a graph. How many of you have heard about graphs, undirected graphs? Very good. So graphs will be our key component or key mathematical tool for formulating these network models. Yes, and we're not only, by the way, we're not only using this network structure for data, but we also attach to each local data set a model. So what is a model, by the way? Does anyone remember what is a model in machine learning? It's a function which we can feed to a machine. Is a model a single function? A family. No, yes, a family. A single function. How do we call a single function in machine learning? What? Hypothesis. Yes, a hypothesis. Machine learning is all about learning a function that reads in some properties of a data point, which we call features and outputs a prediction or a guess for something that we would like to know, like the temperature tomorrow. This is one hypothesis, but learning only happens when you have at least two hypotheses or hypothesis maps. And the model is a set, typically an infinite set of uh, hypothesis maps. Uh, does anyone know uh, an example for a machine learning model? What could be such a set? All possible, uh, yeah, linear, linear functions. Uh, linear functions, this would be a linear model. So we could use here a linear model. Yeah, by the way, uh, is on Zoom, do you see the, the camera, you? Do you see the camera on Zoom? Yes. Me, yeah, there was one question. Yes. Okay, so one could be a linear model. And by the way, linear models are still used in, in numerical weather prediction as I understood good old linear regression. What could be another example of a model in machine learning? What other machine learning models do you know? Decision trees, yes. So we could have a decision tree which gives piecewise constant functions. So here's one decision tree, here's another decision tree. You could also use decision tree. And you will learn in this course, you will learn methods, uh, federated learning methods that can fit different models for these different data sets, but still help each other a bit. So we, we want to use this network structure and data to help the, to mutually help the, the training processes of these models. Otherwise, if you wouldn't use this network structure, it would just fall apart into individual machine learning problems for each weather station. But what we can do in federated learning is we could say, this weather in Turku is similar to the weather in Helsinki, so we should also somehow learn similar models or train the models in a similar way. And in this course, I will tell you some algorithms that implement this principle. Okay, network models. Uh, but then I have already uh, I have already gave gave a glimpse. I already gave a glimpse on the next lecture: federated learning design principle. And this sounds similar to this machine learning design principle. And what, what is common of those two lectures is it's about an optimization problem. What's the key optimization problem in, in machine learning? So this machine learning design principle will be 
uh, empirical risk minimization. So you want you you learn a hypothesis out of a model by minimizing, let's say, the average squared error loss on a data set. So this this is the design principle of machine learning in mathematical terms. Uh, and the federated learning design principle is a special case of this by using specific choices for this hypothesis space. In particular, we will use networks of hypotheses that are coupled over this network. So we, we require the hypothesis here, the hypothesis here to be similar to an extent that is dictated by, by the a weight that we assign to this edge. So the federated learning design principle will be a special case of this optimization problem. Okay, and once we have formulated our design principle as an optimization problem, which is a standard approach in machine learning, you formulate the problem or the application as an optimization problem. And what do you do with an optimization problem? You try to solve it using an optimization method. And that's how you get a machine learning algorithms. So machine learning algorithms are typically optimization algorithms that are applied to specific machine learning problems, like empirical risk minimization for basic machine learning, or uh, we call this special case then generalized total variation minimization or federated learning. No worries if this sounds a bit intimidating for you at this stage, but basically this whole 10, uh, 12 lectures will be uh, uh, building the way that you then understand and learn to appreciate and enjoy uh, this generalized total variation minimization principle. Okay, then we will talk, yeah, by the way, what kind of, what optimization algorithms do you know that we use to solve these machine learning problems? What, what is the most widely used optimization algorithm? Gradient descent. Yes, gradient descent. And by the way, this we talk about in the lecture on the 8th of March. So this should motivate you to, to really uh, try to understand the basic variant of gradient descent, but at really great detail, because many machine learning methods are just applications of gradient descent. Okay, so after we have talked about federated learning algorithms, we look at a few main flavors of federated learning, which go under the name horizontal federated learning, vertical federated learning, clustered federated learning. And it will turn out that all these flavors are just special cases of this one single optimization problem, generalized total variation minimization. So horizontal federated learning is a different way to construct, for example, the loss function than used in vertical federated learning problems. Has any one of you heard about horizontal vertical federated learning? Yeah, not so many. Okay, this is good. So I can tell you something new, but still you might also get a new perspective if you have already heard about this concept. Yes, then towards the end, towards the end, we look at methods to actually learn this edges, this network structure. Because so far, I just have told you, well, there is a network structure. But where do you get this network structure from? Well, in, in some applications, like in weather, you might have this old Finnish meteorological expert, this weather guru, who knows Turku, the weather in Turku is very similar to the weather in Helsinki. But in some applications, you, you do not have yet such a human domain expert, and you need to learn these networks or graphs from data. And there will, I will give a glimpse on a few very powerful, basic but powerful methods to learn this graph or network structure of local data sets. Okay. Then towards the end, we focus on trustworthy federated learning. And this is somewhat, this is somewhat unfortunate, I must say, uh, or it's a bit, it's a bit odd to talk about trustworthy federated learning towards the end of the course because in the end, a federated learning, like all machine learning, is a tool for us humans. So the human is in the center. 
Uh, the reason why I put this trustworthiness and uh, human-centered aspects towards the end is because I'm from an engineering background, so I, I had a much easier time to prepare the earlier lectures than the last lectures because I just recently started to, to realize that I have focused way too much or I didn't take into account this trustworthiness aspect. So my background is engineering. I'm interested in how can I efficiently solve these optimization problems arising in, in, in federated learning, but we should also look into questions like explainability, privacy protection, <clears throat> which go under the umbrella term trustworthy federated learning. And that's why I have three lectures on these aspects. In particular, we will have one lecture on the privacy. So I will tell you a few basic tricks to protect privacy. So you want to, for example, uh, not reveal the presence of a certain person or a certain uh, private weather station in this data set, but still you want to share some information about the weather data in Turku with the meteorologist in, in Helsinki. And there are ways to share information while at the same time protecting sensitive parts of the information. Okay, and the last lecture will be on a very important topic, which is data poisoning, because in, in federated learning, uh, you, you often have, <clears throat> you, you must trust the, the source of the data. So in federated learning, we, we use network collections of data. So we use data that we did not generate ourselves, but they are somewhat downloaded from the internet. And what if <clears throat> there was some adversary uh, kind of tweaking the data such that when you add it to your training set, the trained model has a very specific behavior that you don't know, but that is known by, the, by this adversary. So the adversary poisons the data, plans specific data points, for example, such that when you, when you com uh, combine it via federated learning, you would learn a hypothesis here that has a very regular behavior on most of the data points, but in some region, it behaves like this. So completely odd. And the adversary who, who, uh, who manufactured this data set knows about this behavior and exploits this behavior. So su such a pattern would be called the backdoor. And this pattern is then exploited. For, think about uh, applications where this uh, prediction of, of this machine learning model is used to grant access to a, a, a bio lab. So, and when you predict this value, it means access granted. So you get access to a, a, a very restricted area in a bio lab, for example. Okay, and in this lecture on data poisoning, we will talk about, first of all, we will, we will take the role of the attacker. So how could we poison data sets? And then we take the other role of the defender. How can we defend ourselves against data poisoning? Okay, that was the overview of the lectures. That's the, the menu plan I have for you, mostly for this period, period four. Uh, period five, we then give time for the, the project for those who want to go for the 10 credit variant. Uh, yeah, any questions at this point? Is there something uh, that, uh, of these topics that surprises you that you wouldn't have expected or would you have expected to, to me to include something else? No, oh, okay. So, yes. Or a general question, what are the main advantages of using the network structure and separate models instead of letting a single model learn the network structure from the feature in a single optimal set? Right. Is it just more efficient? Uh, yeah, so it depends, of course, on the, on the application settings. So in some applications, you Think about uh, where this local data set is, uh, is uh, generated by a smartphone. So I want to learn 
let's say I want to learn a predictor that uh, predicts if I should go for, for a run tomorrow, like a personal training assistant. I want to learn the best assistant for me. So you, this is called personalization. So when we want to have personalized model, then we should have different models for each local data set. And also it might make sense to, to use different models because the data sets have very different uh, patterns. But what we could always do, we could say, so that the naive approach would be to, to download, to collect all the local data sets like this FMI data. You can log in the, the FMI weather stations. This I might show actually, that's a good point. So you might go to the, weather data uh, site and download all the uh, observations from all stations. So we have, where do we have it? Get observation data. Download observations. Yeah, and here you can collect the station name. Yeah, and collect this. So this would be a local data set for weather stations in Hamaya. And you can do this for Olu, for Tampere, and so on and so forth. Collect this together into, for example, this computer and then train a, a Skikit learn model. One, one single model. Why could this be not the most efficient way to do it? Well, there are different uh, different settings or scenarios where this could be not efficient. First of all, it might be not so easy to, to communicate the data. Think of a weather station being a small Raspberry Pi somewhere in the forest in the north of Finland, which is connected to the internet via, uh, I don't know, very, very uh, low bandwidth or low rate connection. So uh, sending all this data might take much longer than just, uh, than just sharing a bit of information from the neighboring node. And this will be also a, a nice feature of the federated learning algorithms. They don't share raw data, but they share uh, let's something like parameter uh, parameter vector updates. And instead of so, this this local data set could be millions of bits, but this parameter vector update needs ten bits. So it's a form of compression already. Also, from this perspective, it might make more sense to to use network models and also use this distributed federated learning algorithms that that basically exchange messages over this network structure. Okay, another, what, what else, why uh, could federated learning be more useful than just collecting all the raw data? Yeah, uh, a main application domain of federated learning so far is, is healthcare. And in healthcare, these local data sets could be uh, a patient database at a healthcare provider. And it might be not, not allowed from uh, privacy protect or data protection or regulations to, to share this uh, raw data. So here also this sharing only this parameter vector updates is a form uh, to protect privacy that is uh, uh, contained or private information that is contained in this uh, healthcare records. So privacy protection is also an argument uh, in favor of federated learning. Uh, yes, but there might also be situation, situations where actually collecting all the data and then running a Skikit learn model might be the best. This, uh, I do not exclude this possibility. Because that is uh, basically um, the one project I did for, for my child, like, um, District heating network in Helsinki. We have different uh, weather measurements in Helsinki. Uh, in that kind of situation, uh, I, I did kind of a black box thing. They took all the like pressure measurement from the network where we, we have to each heat where something should be. They the uh, weather measurements from different places. Mm -hmm. 
in in that kind of situation, uh, is there like a more intelligent way of uh, encoding in the model uh, how the uh, weather station locations are related to the uh, heating network, for example, not just maybe the black box model that takes in all the data and learns from it, but uses the network structure and the relation to the uh, weather. Uncertainty. Yes, yes. So the, the algorithms I will talk about in the lectures uh, later on, they will take as input uh, the network structure. So you, you provide the local data sets plus you tell which data sets should be similar or are similar to each other. That would be more data. Like, giving Maybe. More input. Yes, yes. But this would be a very interesting student project. Just mentioning. Yeah. But yeah, if you want, we can also have a, a talk uh, offline then about research topics. Huh? Okay. What else? Why could be federated learning useful? Uh, yeah, did any one of you take uh, take the course para uh, programming parallel computers? Yes, one of the best, maybe the best course in the world, at least the best produced course in my opinion. So uh, when you look at this network data, typically the, the local data sets are generated by something uh, that computes, can compute like a smartphone. So each one of us has a smartphone, I guess. Uh, so this is a parallel computer. So federated learning, the federated learning algorithms I will uh, tell you about, they are decentralized optimization methods. And in a form, they are a, a parallel pro uh, computer program, a way to program parallel computers. And this parallel computer is given by the network of uh, smartphones, for example, or a network of Raspberry Pis, which sends uh, environment uh, data. Okay. So let me quickly check the time. Yeah, I have a few more minutes. Yeah. So, are there any any more questions at this point about the course logistics, basic idea of federated learning? Yes. Sorry, could you repeat again? Yeah. One. You have to put your name only once for each lab. Yes. Yes. You have to put your name only once. So if this is not clear. Yeah. Yeah, only once. So this, this whole sheet is for lab one. You can only take lab one once, or you can only get points for lab one once. If if you like it, you and there is there is space, you can do it several times, but you can only get once these five points. Okay. Yes, so if there are no more questions, then thanks for your attention and see you on Wednesday, same place, same time. And I will talk about the three main components of machine learning and how they are combined by an optimization problem called empirical risk minimization. 
The corresponding sections in the lecture notes are two and three. So I, I warmly recommend to brief, at least briefly read over those sections. And on Wednesday, we will also open the first quiz. Okay. Yes. Yes, thank you. So there's a question. Can students who are enrolled with FITEC participate in the labs? Yes. Okay, if there are more questions of uh, further questions, please don't hesitate to ask in the Slack or via the course email address. Thanks a lot.